urgently need to decarbonise our energy supply. But there is an elephant in this room, and it's a big one, nuclear power. The process of generating nuclear energy doesn't generate carbon dioxide, but it does come with some other very serious downsides. So we thought it was time to look at the arguments for and against nuclear energy. Where are we now and how and why might nuclear energy be a part of a sustainable future? Welcome to The Fully Charged Show. Like The Fully Charged Show? Then you will love our six live shows being held around the world in 2023, starting with Sydney, Australia on March the 11th and 12th. Nuclear power is a really difficult issue to talk about because it's really complicated and it's also really divisive. Now we're going to do our best in this episode, but we're not going to cover all the nuances, but we'd love you to pick up the conversation in the comments. And it's worth clarifying as well that what we're talking about here is nuclear fission, which is the source of nuclear power we've already got, and not nuclear fusion, which is the one we haven't quite invented yet. Now, before we get to today, it's quite useful to take a look at how we ended up here, because it wasn't supposed to be like this. The arrival of the atomic age in 1945 shocked the world but it was followed closely by a stream of optimistic promises that this new inexhaustible fuel supply was going to generate, it was going to fuel a new technological utopia. It would be the end of poverty and war and global conflict. And the public lapped it up. The Ford Motor Company even made a concept nuclear powered car called the Ford Nucleon. It's really weird to look back and think about how different our climate would be now if all of those promises had played out. But this new utopia never arrived. Nuclear turned out to be complicated and expensive and oil was cheap. And then as the 1970s and 80s rolled on, the risk of nuclear accidents became all too apparent with Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. And so the pendulum swung away from nuclear power and then it was kind of coming back until 2011 when the Fukushima reactor suffered three meltdowns as a result of being hit by a tsunami. And that scared a lot of countries off. So Germany, for example, committed to just getting rid of all its nuclear power. And then the pendulum swung again. Energy prices started to increase. Russia invaded Ukraine. And it also became apparent that the climate crisis really needs action now. And nuclear power is a low carbon source of energy. And so the history of nuclear power is 80 years of a pendulum swinging between how amazing and useful nuclear power is when it really works and how horrifically dreadful it is when it goes wrong. And that gets us to today. So the question here isn't about what the best power sources are, because we know that those are things like wind and solar. The question is, what do we use when the best isn't available, when the renewables we have can't or won't do the job? Um, and this thinking on this is changing quite quickly. So in October this year, Greta Thunberg said that it would be a mistake to turn off nuclear power plants if that meant burning more coal. And that highlights something that is really important in all of this. It is all about trade-offs. Um, the risks of radioactivity are terrible, but so are the consequences of having a load of extra carbon dioxide poured into the atmosphere. There is no ideal option here, really. We've got to look honestly at two options, neither of which are very pleasant. Um, and so we can see the nuclear legacy of the past. So we can see, for example, that around 100,000 terawatt hours of energy has been generated by nuclear power. But generating it by nuclear has prevented us from burning 40 billion tonnes of coal, which is what we'd have needed to generate that energy otherwise. It's, it's not a simple trade-off. Um, but of, of course, along with that has come hundreds of thousands of tonnes of nuclear waste. And so there's something really important about this debate, and this is the reason it's so contentious, is that there is no follow the science here. We have to understand that we need two things. We need evidence about how the world works and how technology is going to develop and all of that kind of stuff. But it also depends on our values. And quite often people don't mention their values. They're not open about that when they're having a discussion. And that's why when you start to research this issue, to dig into it, you can totally find a study that says it's completely one way and then find another one right next to it that says it's completely the opposite. And it's because they're using different starting assumptions and different value systems. That's why this is all really complicated to pick apart. 
So what we're going to do here is first of all look at the downsides of nuclear power and that's mostly the issue of nuclear waste and then we're going to look at the upsides like why is it that in spite of those downsides we're still talking about this how and why could it help us reach net zero so it's worth a quick reminder of what radioactivity actually is the way that nuclear fission works is that you take a big atom like uranium or plutonium and you split it into two fragments and with those two fragments comes a big chunk of energy so that's how our current nuclear reactors work but those waste products, they aren't stable. And so they emit radiation in the form of particles or very energetic light as they settle down. And it's that radiation which can cause damage and can be a problem. And with that comes the concept of half-life. And the half-life is the amount of time it takes for the radioactivity from a source to halve. And then after the same length of time, it will halve again and it will halve again. And half-lives can be anywhere from a few seconds to thousands of years. So that is the radioactive problem we have to deal with. Let's talk to one of the UK's experts in nuclear waste management to see what actually happens to it. So we've had about 75 years of civil nuclear energy generation in the UK, and that's forecast to generate about 4.5 million meter cubed of radioactive waste. Uh, most of the radioactive waste is currently stored safely and securely on the Sellafield site, but also at several other sites around the country. And now that nuclear power is sort of coming back and people are talking about new types of reactor and, and these small modular reactors and things like that, is the waste from future nuclear reactors going to be much different from the waste of the past? So within the current frame of thinking, uh, mo the, the nuclear new build programme will generate radioactive waste, which is within our current envelope of expectations and experience. Um, some of the more exotic advanced modular reactors might need more consideration. What, where will it go in the long term, that sort of waste? So the end point or an end point for managing uh, that radioactive waste, an end point for the most hazardous radioactive waste is disposal in a deep de geological disposal facility to isolate, contain, and assure the passive safety of that radioactive waste. And just describe to us what a geological disposal facility is. So this is a highly engineered facility that will be constructed 200 to 1,000 metres underground. And its purpose is to isolate and contain the radioactive waste until it's safely decayed to a level where it can't cause harm to humans uh, or, or living systems. And so there's this question about, you know, we kind of, it's hard to test this stuff, right? Because we can't wait 200 years to see what it does and then come back and re-engineer it based on what happened. So how, how sure can we be that it's really still going to be working in, in two or 300 years time? So uh, we have the technology uh, maturing to be able to implement a geological disposal facility. And the first waste emplacement in a, in a GDF will take place in Finland towards the end of this decade. But behind that sits the, the whole uh, system of safe, safety cases, uh, which are claims, arguments, and evidence uh, to demonstrate that the, the facility will evolve safely. And so one part of that, for example, is what we call natural analogs. So these are either geological uh, systems or they might be man-made systems uh, where we can point to to demonstrate that uh, our, our models are validated by behavior in, in systems that we can study, which have evolved over millions or hundreds or thousands of years. And how, how expensive is it to deal with nuclear waste and who pays for it? Is, it? is it the government or is it the company that originally generated the power? So our current cost estimates are around 20 to 53 billion pounds uh, to manage the radioactive waste that needs to be disposed of in a GDF to the end point. And the reason that we've got such a, a wide cost range is because there are significant uncertainties in the site to be developed, uh, the design, which will be uh, tailored to the site, and, and the radioactive wastes, which are yet to be packaged. So that's why we have such a large range. So in terms of the legacy radioactive wastes uh, produced from previous generations of power stations, uh, that will be funded by the taxpayer, that component of the cost. For new build nuclear power stations, there's a, a levy in the, in the charge for the electricity generation, uh, which uh, is uh, passed on uh, to, to government, and that will uh, fund the cost of the decommissioning and waste packaging and disposal. 
what what are the things that you think people need to know about it? You know, perhaps to to bust some myths or to correct some misconceptions. What are the things you'd like to put on the T-shirt and tell the world? So I think often when we're out um, you know, talking, particularly with the public and those who aren't sort of intimately involved in in this endeavour, the kind of you know, unsurprisingly, it's a it's a bit of it's a bit of a mystery to them because you know, they, they don't understand necessarily why we need it or the challenge involved and so on. And you know, sometimes they can be mistrustful from their own experience or um, perceptions of, of nuclear energy and its history. So what I would say is, you know, as we go forward with this project, science and integrity are absolutely at the heart of what we will do. So we will ensure that you know, our arguments of safety and our presentation of safety is scientifically underpinned and we will carry out the work to demonstrate that with absolute integrity so that the public, decision makers and others can, can have absolute trust in our work. Waste isn't the only downside of nuclear energy. It's a complicated technology, it's expensive, and it's got a history of cost overruns. And then there's the question about whether we actually need it at all, because wind and solar have been improving really dramatically over the past 10 years. And last year in the UK, wind and solar and other renewables provided 35% of all of our electricity. But then electricity is only 20% of our overall energy use. There's all those factories that are running on their gas generators that are working 24-7 that need a really high baseload in order to operate. And then what about those days, those cold, calm, cool winter days when the sun's not shining and there's no wind? So it all starts to look really complicated. There's a whole system that we need to look at here. So let's talk to someone whose job it is to analyse that system at the International Energy Agency. Nuclear provides sort of the foundation. Uh, it, it provides that, that bottom sort of piece that uh, allows wind and solar to be variable. And, and uh, um, with there, there would be times uh, in a high renewables uh, wind and solar grid where um, neither of them are producing all that much. And a sort of a buffer of, of nuclear power um, would be would allow the power system to maintain security, uh, allow us to keep the lights on uh, while wind and solar are not uh, you know, providing up to their full potential. So the idea here is that renewables are great when they're part of the solution, but when you get to the last five or ten percent, it becomes a lot harder and more expensive to, to fill that gap using renewables. And that's what nuclear power would do. I think we we see that wind and solar will provide, will, will dominate uh, the, the future power system, uh, but we do need other sources, and particularly we need uh, sources of low carbon and dispatchable generation, uh, so a generation that you can uh, turn on and off when you need it. Uh, we also want more local sources of, 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 of generation, so we don't want, if we don't want to rely necessarily on uh, foreign countries for for our fuel, um, then the nuclear is uh, could can be a good option for that as well. And so for that that small part of of the power system where where nuclear can play a role, we we see that uh, it has potential there. So what would you say to the the sort of perhaps the nuclear skeptics out there? You know, there's a lot of people who have they care very much about the environment. They sort of say, well, you know, having all this waste hanging around, that's not such a good thing. Do we really need nuclear? What do you say to them? Well, I think governments can do a, a better job at making those risks known and, and clear to, to the public and assuring them that, that the nuclear can be safe and make, taking all possible steps to do so. Um, you know, on the, on the expense side, you know, we, we understand that, you know, it will not be the dominant uh, form of electricity generation in the future and 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 just having that little bit uh, of nuclear can provide really high value to to the power system uh, in order to complement how uh, how variable renewables 
uh, are, inc are, are incorporated into the power system. Fundamentally, this is all about the values we choose to have and the trade-offs we're prepared to make. So, for example, do we prioritise cost over speed in the energy transition? Do we trust the nuclear industry that their promises for these small modular reactors are actually going to happen in practice? Or do we hedge our bets in case they don't? How do we balance speed of decarbonisation against energy security? And how can we wor really work on reducing our own energy usage? Because reducing that makes a lot of these other problems go away. But fundamentally, when we're talking about nuclear, there's a choice in front of us, a really big trade-off to make. Do we choose to leave future generations a pile of nuclear waste appropriately stored? Or do we choose to leave them the consequences of massive extra amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? Because those effects are known and very, very serious. When we're looking at all of this, it's not about individual technologies. We need to compare scenarios. We need to think about the detail of what this all means. It's a complex system and there are no easy answers here. So what's the status of all of this now? Well, in the UK, nuclear power currently makes up 17% of our electricity supply. And it's estimated that by 2050, our electricity demand is going to at least double. So we need to find a lot of extra energy from somewhere. Current government policy is that 25% of that by 2050 will be made up of nuclear power. And so there is a huge amount of government policy directed towards making this happen. So currently in the UK, the decision has been made, nuclear is part of our future. But worldwide, it's a different story and maybe other countries will make different decisions. So there is a lot to discuss, a lot of nuance to get into, and we do encourage you to carry on this discussion in the comments. We know it's an issue that a lot of people feel very strongly about. We will be digging into these issues more in the future, but that's all we've got time for for this episode. So do like, comment and subscribe. And if you have been, thank you for watching. <laughs>